Hi and welcome back to the History Hut. I'm Jim, this is Dr. K and we've been kind of talking about the Act of Union except we haven't actually talked about it yet. So can we finally talk uh, about the Union? Oh, you're so pushy, so you are. Yes, we can. Uh, so we, we talked about the whole problem of the succession. We've mm -hmm. talked about the you know, so-called economic collapse of Scotland. We've talked about the Glencoe Massacre. We've talked about Darien. And uh, we talked about you know William's opposition to Darien, and you know the the um, his in his last Parliament the Darien issue was actually unresolved, and then he died in uh, 1702. But even in his last year, he was really focused on international politics, not so much on domestic ones. And the other Stuart daughter Anne, of course, succeeded him, and I said to you before that she was pregnant countless amounts of times, and then her one surviving son died in 1700 at the age of 11. Uh, and her husband um, died in 1708, and, and you know that had been a diplomatic marriage, and I don't think she, uh, you know, was keen to go on uh, with another one. Mm -hmm. And uh, Charles had said of her husband, "I've tried him drunk and sober. There's nothing in him, so mm. probably not <laughs> the most exciting of uh, of, of marriages." Um, she, uh, so the the whole question when she came to the throne was, you know, who would who would reign after her death? And we've already kind of answered that. And uh, she, when she did die, she died of gout, which is excruciatingly painful. Uh, and it's possible that she also had that, that porphyria that we talked about for uh, James VI and maybe St. Anthony's fire as well. So she was in, a, she was in really bad shape at the time she died. Um, nonetheless, you know, the, the speculation when her, when her son died, speculation was rife about you know, what they were going to do. And so in 1701, England passed the Act of Settlement. So that's the kind of initial sally in this. Uh, and it named Sophie as heir, and it was to stop um, James in exile from uh, you know from claiming the throne and James II actually died in 1701 so it was his son the bedpan warming scheme one mm. you know um, James the third that uh, that would have been that would have been king or that you know, would have been available to be king so the Scots refused to follow suit and instead they asked for time to consider their options. <laughs> and so the English are like, oh, these people, you know, nothing but trouble. Mm -hmm. um, so Queen Anne actually uh, set up a commission for union because she's like, okay, this is it, you know, we're going to sort this out once and for all uh, and had her succession ratified, but it kind of fizzles out for lack of support in Scotland. And so uh, this issue is just becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, Who, who's going to be next and how are the Scots going to react? So in 1703, the Scots elect a new parliament. It's really feisty, it's really obstructionist, and it refuses to vote the supply to run, uh, to run civil government. And um, it said it won't do that until the question of succession was dealt with. So the Scots passed through three acts, the Act of Security, the Act Anent War and Peace, and the Wine Act. And the Wine Act might not seem like, mm -hmm. seem like much, but it's just kind of a slap in the face. So um, the Act of Security more or less said that the Scots didn't have to choose the same monarch as the English. It would still pick from the Stuart line, but it didn't. I mean, I don't know who they were going to pick, but yeah. um, it would be, the successor would be nominated by Parliament. It should be someone of the Royal Line of Scotland. Uh, should be Protestant, but could be a different person from the one that the English choose. And we've seen this, the Scots Parliament acting in a more independent way. And then they passed the Act Anent War and Peace, which said that no successor to Anne could declare war on Scotland's behalf without the Scots agreeing. So they're not just acting, um, you know, it's kind of, we'll do whatever you, you, you say. So <clears throat> the goal of all this was to kind of define the constitutional position of Scotland upon the death of Anne. And uh, the English were upset. And at the end of the session, all of the acts except the act of security were touched by the scepter and passed. And then the house was adjourned. And the Scots had also passed this wine act that allowed it to import wine from France, even if Scotland and, uh, or sorry, even if England were in, and France were at war. So it's kind of a, ch -ch, you know, yeah. uh, we're still going to do that. Uh, so um, that you know that made the Queen's party unhappy, and it showed that the <coughs> the Queen of the Island, <coughs> pardon me, the Queen of the Island didn't control all of the island, only part of the island. So that's mm -hmm. not good. So in 1704, when the session opened, it was a really turbulent one, <coughs> and Parliament refused to do any business until uh, the succession question had been settled. 
And at one point, it was suggested that the Scots shouldn't name a successor until the English signed a free trade deal with the Scots. So they're kind of like putting on the pressure. Uh, but Anne had all sorts of other problems. Uh, she's involved in the War of Spanish Succession. And so she told her ministers for the moment to accept a kind of watered down version of the Act of Security. Um, <clears throat> and really, that's, that's the best that she could hope for. So in 1705, uh, the English reaction to this really stubborn, independent Scots Parliament was seen in, uh, in yet another act. So that the Scottish reaction is really problematic mm -hmm. for the English. Uh, and then the English uh, pass a, 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 another act called the Aliens Act. Okay, and is it the Aliens Act that sort of pushes union negotiations? Absolutely. Um, the Aliens Act says that if the act of security is not repealed, the one that she had allowed to be touched for the scepter, mm -hmm. and the Hanoverian succession isn't accepted, and a treaty of union uh, isn't in negotiation by December 25th of 1705, then the Queen's Scottish subjects would all be treated as aliens in all matters. And that meant that Scots trade with England <laughs> would just stop. Mm -hmm. Remember we talked about you know, 40% of the trade being cattle on the hoof. So, um, so there are veiled threats made that force would be used to subdue the North. So it wouldn't be an equal partner in mm -hmm. you know, the island's politics. And so this, this is what absolutely drives it. So the Scots Parliament reopens in June of 1705. They get to business on, on the union right away. They actually draft an act of union. So this is like a mega threat to anyone who has money, who is a merchant venturer, uh, who's a you know, domestic merchant, overseas merchant, everybody. So mm -hmm. we've been talking about how, how this great vitality of the merchant class from 1660 up till now. That, so this threatens to absolutely just you know, kill them. So this is yeah. like a real, whether it could have been done or not is another question, but you know, it's actually, that it's actually stated by your own queen. Your own queen is acting mm -hmm. against you. So again, you know, it's, it's, it's a problem. Uh, and they realize really that they, there's not much they can do, I suppose. So in a snap vote, in a thinly attended house, the, they decided that the queen could uh, choose who should negotiate. So she chose everybody that she chose, uh, except for one guy, George Carnwath, um, was pro-union. And the interesting thing about him is that he actually, because he was anti-union, he actually left a record of the negotiations. So you get a kind of sense of, of what was going on in the house. So, um, you know, for his trouble in this matter, Lord Hamilton, the Queen's Minister, received an English dukedom, the Order of the Thistle and the Garter, and the job as ambassador to Paris. So mm. he did well out of it. Um, and other important figures like Queensbury, the Queen's Commissioner, received an English dukedom, an annual pension of 3,000 pounds, and a lump sum of 10,000 pounds on the eve of the debate in the Scots Parliament. So um, this is why you get the, the Burns poem, uh, parcel of rogues in a nation, you know, what force or guile could ne'er subdue through many uh, warlike ages is wrought now by a coward few for hireling traitors' wages. The English steel we could disdain, secure in valor station, but English gold has been our bane, such a parcel of rogues in a nation. So this whole, this idea then, that uh, the elite in Scotland are absolutely selling everybody out. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, what kind of terms are in this? Um, Scotland was going to be allowed to send 45 MPs to the English House of Commons. The English House of Commons had 513 MPs, including 44 for the little duchy of Cornwall. So we got um, 45. And they were allowed to send 16 elected peers to the Lords. Scotland would get to keep its Privy Council. Uh, it would get uh, freedom of trade with England and her colonies, which is what everybody's been wanting for God knows how long. Uh, the, uh, there'd be uniformity of coin weights and measures, there'd be one fiscal system, and this equivalent would be paid out 398,000 pounds to offset future liabilities, including the money that had been put into the Darien scheme, which is about okay. 230,000 pounds, and the rest of it was to go to um, foster domestic industry. And Scotland would retain its church, its legal system, its educational system. Now, in fact, the provision that protected the church was a kind of late addition, and it was only added when the Queen's ministers realized that they might not get the Act of Union passed. And so uh, they guaranteed the Church of Scotland and so the, the vote swung quite dramatically in favor of, uh, of pro-union forces. Now, one of the interesting things about this is this equivalent, and uh, I was reading a, a wee book recently about this, the, the equivalent wasn't actually paid out. 
so, so it looks on paper like you get £398,000, which would have paid off Darien and the national debt. But of course, the Scots belonging now to the, the uh, English Union had to pay or were responsible for half of the overall national debt. And for England in 1707, its national debt was 14.5 million. And by 1714, it's 36 million. And over 50% of its taxes went to pay um, this previously incurred debt. So you, 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 know, you enter, but you take on this, this huge debt load. And the equivalent was to cover, in part, the cost of standardizing the coinage. And that came to 50,000 pounds. So of that money that would eventually be paid, uh, 50,000 pounds would go to that. Uh, the Darien shareholders were to be given 230,000, but they don't get it all. The commissioners gave themselves 30,000 pounds for you know, making the deal. And um, the, somewhere between 160,000 and 250,000 pounds were due uh, to pay the salary arrears of civil servants and um, Scottish debts and um, you know, militia costs. So uh, if you look at all of that taken together, it's not actually a very good deal at all. And in this book I was reading, it said that a few months after the union, only 100,000 pounds in cash was actually sent up and there was such a fuss that they had to send up another 50,000 and then uh, it looks as though um, the rest of it was paid in uh, debentures and kind of stocks and stuff. So it isn't actually as good as, uh, mm -hmm. as it even looks where you go, oh well, you got all that money, but it, you know, so much of it's going other places. Yeah. And by that time, the Darien shareholders had, uh, I think they were getting a sixth of the, the value of their paper mm -hmm. and so they'd, a lot of them had sold it off. So it's other people that benefited yeah. from that as well. So what's so the reaction in Scotland? Absolutely terrible. There's an absolute uproar in Scotland. Public opinion is dead set against it and there are prolonged riots in Edinburgh, Glasgow, Dumfries. Um, people, you know, shouting no union, no union. Um, the English reaction isn't very happy either. Um, there's a bitter pamphleteering war uh, against it in England. Uh, the Scots Parliament doesn't seem to be all that happy, although Anne sends up £20,000 in silver right before the vote is taken. So that's like a, you know, and, you know, some people have said, well, obviously they're bribed into it, but bribery was the way things worked, so it's okay. But, I mean, that's not really... That's not really. Yeah. That's not really right. Um, so, uh, so there, there is a, a terrible, terrible reaction in in Scotland. Um, English troops were on alert in the border because there were popular riots nightly, and hundreds of anti-union pamphlets were published. And uh, some of the House leaders said that uh, the public storm against the union should actually be taken into account. Um, but that was quickly defeated, and there was a proclamation instead issued forbidding public meetings about unions, so you couldn't actually come out or. You You'd be, you'd be hauled in. So <clears throat> we don't really have uh, pro-union um, pamphleteers or pamphleteering, um, but at the anti-union pamphlets are, are um, still available to be read. So uh, it's kind of forced through by the elite. You know, at the top level, uh, people that are pushing it through are, are going to do quite well out of it. So um, 16th of January, 1707, it's ratified 110 uh, versus 67 in Scotland. Um, in April, they adjourned, and on April 28, 1707, um, the House is dissolved. So few countries actually uh, sign themselves out of existence. And in mm -hmm. fact, you know, most countries fight to become independent, and, and uh, we get to do the exact opposite. Uh, so then it went to, uh, or it was, went to England, and it passed both houses and um, came into effect on May the 1st, 1707. Uh, and it was really interesting because just recently in uh, BBC Scotland, January 26, 2014, uh, they were talking about Scottish independence and, and it was talking about two leading academics, Dr. Karen Bowie and Dr. Claire Jackson, uh, saying that um, a separate coronation ceremony might be necessary, um, you, know, oh. it, you know, if there's, uh, if there's independence because you know, it's kind of cool. What's our, uh, what are historians uh, saying about this period? Well, um, there, there's, there's quite a few different, uh, I, of course, recently there's been, there's been a whole new batch of books because this was coming up, but uh, before that, people have been writing about it for a very, very long time. Um, there was, it was something that people often forget was this threat of military action. Um, historian uh, P.H. Scott, he talked about the three regiments of foot at the borders, the three regiments of horse in Northern Ireland, plus foot regiments and dragoons, and uh, another 800 horse added to the border troops. 
and saying, you know, um, with others uh, as well, other commentators, commentators saying that um, many in Scotland, this is a quote, many in Scotland expected a scene of misfortune like during the civil wars, feeling that the whole country would fall under the domination of England as a right of conquest. The union then was thought of as the best expedient to preserve the honor and liberties of Scotland. So you give it up because there's a, there's a threat that, that, you know, these, um, these troops might come in and you'll come in as a conquered country, so it'll mm -hmm. be just like the Cromwellian period again, I guess. Um, T.B. Smith, who is a constitutional historian, he said, uh, the Scots commissioners of 1706 were certainly negotiating under the implied threat, if negotiations failed, of invasion by one of the great captains of history, that's Marlborough, at the head of a veteran army backed by the military resources of the most powerful state in Europe, so Union offered peace. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, people often forget that part that, uh, you know, that there was a the chance that, that we would be invaded and uh, come out uh, a little on the worst side. But most of the Whig historians um, and many of the English historians see it as a kind of manifest destiny, a, a minor distraction on the great English push forward. Of course, they, they're looking back from the period where um, England had become the great empire. Mm -hmm. and saying, well, this is the kind of beginning we were marching towards that. That's what Quick historians do. Mm -hmm. They like anything kind of Protestant democratic. They don't like tyrannical um, absolutism, which would be, you know, seemingly if you had a Catholic king. So some of the Whig historians, um, Mackey said, it was a remarkable achievement which was visionary for in bringing the two countries together, it preserved forever the nationality of Scotland. Now, does that not seem a little odd? So you preserve yourself by giving your whole self up, right? Yeah. Um, uh, J.H. Barton said, Union is the happy climax of the great romance of our history. Those who should never have been separated are firmly united at last. So just like this kind of marriage thing, um, uh, Hume Brown said, for Scottish people, the surrender of autonomy was a sacrifice to which only the instinct of self-preservation could have reconciled them. You know, so you give it up to keep it. And then Trevelyan, um, the great uh, historian of, of Queen Anne said, Scotland was not really independent anyway, having no official diplomatic representatives, no war fleet, and only a tiny army. Only union with England could release her from poverty and isolation and allow her to participate in the great glories which lay ahead the empire, right? So that's really um, mm -hmm. hindsight. Uh, and all the way up to the 20th century, uh, the, the kind of pushed view was that uh, union had been a good thing because it ensured Protestant kings, kings that would be controlled by the rising uh, powers of, of parliaments, not Catholic absolutist kings that didn't listen to anybody. Um, and then in the mid 20th century, historical scholarship kind of shifted from being predominantly political to economic uh, and to look at imperial studies. The, the argument was that Scotland was this kind of um, backwater, a poor country on the periphery, and it was going to be left behind by the, the, the greatness that English had, the English had to offer. And so, um, you know, the, the English kind of threw them this one last lifeline and said, come on with us, you're collapsing, everything's going mm. wrong. Come with us, it's going to be great. Uh, and that they would have been absolute fools to object to this. Well, of course, now we're in the kind of post-imperial period where England doesn't have a great empire mm -hmm. and none of those things actually uh, count. So since the 1960s, other historians um, have raised new issues. Uh, um, P.W.J. Riley focused on kind of realistic power politics and he said that it was Scottish nobles that would do anything for a monopoly of power, and this is a quote from him. The union was made by men of limited vision for a very short term and for petty, if not squalid, aims. In intention, it had little to do with the needs of England and less with those of Scotland, but a great deal to do with political, private political ambitions. So again, you know, it's all about the elite. And the, you know, the modern master of political history and uh, outspoken proponent of the view that the union was won by bribery is uh, William Ferguson and he argued that of course just because uh, politicians were paid off in those days this doesn't mean that you know you can't say that that they were bribed into doing this because mm -hmm. clearly there's money and titles uh, changing hands and of course uh, his work also shows that the massive sums uh, that were being that were being brought up and paid directly to people, uh, patronage appointments being handed out, you know, for the correct result. So I think now, you know, you can kind of see that the union isn't really and wasn't inevitable, and um, it wasn't a marriage between two that should never have been separated. You know, some historians even said, um, you know, there wasn't any point in Scottish history from 
the wars of independence in, in 1296 until now. That was just a waste of time because we should have all been together from that moment on. So when you're just kind of negating everything that happens in Scotland for 500 years uh, in, in favour of just going, well, we should have been together right from the start, you know, so it's really hopeless. Um, and and you, you can see also that it's not necessarily an act of high statesmanship, statesmanship it's, a, it's a necessary outcome for English foreign policy because they're constantly facing the French and um, France can use Scotland as a backdoor into England, it can use you know, Scotland, the, the, uh, the kings in exile, to perhaps you know, make a run at England. Um, and it's an opportunity for greed and for power by Scottish nobles, and it's an act that's obviously helped along by bribery and with the threat, that everybody forgets about this threat of military action. You know, the, the English army was, you know, it had been in the war of, Spani of uh, Spanish succession. This is a veteran army that could, you know, take down anybody, and the mm -hmm. Scots don't have a standing army or anything. Uh, so even in the 1970s, when the first um, Scottish independence movement uh, became popular with voters, of course it had been active uh, from long before that, um, these two old Whig approaches were trotted out by the English in the House of Commons, and you can go and read the Hansards and see what people were saying when there was the threat uh, of uh, Scottish independence. And the argument was, first of all, Scotland would become a poor peripheral backwater on the edge of Europe unless it gave up its hopes of independence. Sound familiar? Yes. And uh, the second argument was, of course, as part of England or Great Britain, Scotland had participated and would continue to particip participate in the most powerful and wealthy empire the world had ever seen. Well, you know, um, the Scots still elected members of the Scottish Nationalist Party to Westminster uh, in the 70s, Winnie Ewing, uh, and then, um, uh, among others, and then, of course, in the late 90s, um, the Scots uh, brought up the, the, the idea of independence again, and uh, Tony Blair, who was uh, trying to beat John Major, uh, it didn't say you could have independence, but he said, well, what about devolution? What about we give you devolved powers and you can have a parliament back? Uh, and so that's the, the beginning, I, I really think, of the, the, uh, the modern thing, uh, the modern issue. And of course, in September of 2014, the Scots go to the polls again to decide whether, um, you know, it's better to just stay in this old tatty relationship mm -hmm. or, or, or in fact uh, go at their own. And, and the economic things are coming up again. Oh, you'll run out of oil or run out of this, or oh, we, you know, we've supported you more than, than you deserve and you'll become like this really poor, horrible place. And the Scots have been able to argue quite nicely against that possibility. Uh, and then I suppose the, the, the last thing would be, um, there are a couple of just a, a few remarks in the Union from contemporary to modern sources, and we already talked uh, about um, Robert Burns, but Andrew Fletcher of Saltoon, who was an anti-Union man, remarked in 1703, and this is you know, before the Union happens, uh, a quote, uh, I have observed that a treaty of union has never been mentioned by the English, but with the design to amuse us when they apprehended any danger from our nation. Remember we talked about 1603, they're not interested, it's mm -hmm. forced on us in the 1650s. And when their apprehensions were blown over, they've always shown that they had no such intention. And so he was hoping that would happen this time. Uh, Lord Belhaven gave an anti-union speech to Parliament in November of 1706. And this is, I get lots of classical references. I think I see a free and independent kingdom delivering up that which all the world have been fighting for since the days of Nimrod, that for which most of the empires, kingdoms, states, and principalities of Europe are at this time engaged in the most bloody and cruel wars that ever were, to wit, a power to manage their own affairs by themselves. So we were doing the exact opposite, why? But above all, I think I see our ancient mother, Caledonia, like Caesar, sitting in the midst of her senate, ruefully looking around her, covering herself with her royal garment, attending the fatal blow, and breathing out her last with an etu quoque mi fili. And then there's another one, um, 30 years later, Lord Lovett uh, talking in 1736, and it's in a letter to a friend, so this is after the union, and. He said that uh, he was convinced, and I quote, uh, that the cursed union will be broken, and then Scotsmen must be Scotsmen, whether they will or not, whereas we are now but poor, mean, servile, and mercenary English slaves. 
We have brought ourselves to that base, cursed, infamous and degenerate situation by our own treachery towards our country, which should have been dearer to us than all mankind. So we deserve all we meet with from our old enemies to whom we gave ourselves up like traitors, like fools and like cowards, though we well knew them to be our natural and inveterate enemies for over 700 years. There may be a particular Englishman that has a real friendship for a particular Scotsman, but the English nation in general always did and will hate ours. The hatred of the Scots nation is the real principle of all Englishmen. So 30 years after, you know, this kind of sentiment. And then uh, one of the modern poets, we talked a bit about uh, Robert Burns, but one of the modern poets, Hugh McDermott, um, wrote in one of his most famous uh, 20th century poem, um, poems called The Parrot Cry, written in Lowland Scots, and he said, tell me the old, old story of who the union brought poor Scotland into being as a country worth the thought. England, for whom all blessings flow, what could we do without you? Then dinner threep at dinner throats, and gin we e'er could do you. My feelings lying with gratitude had been sincerely harrowed. That dod, I think it's time the claith was o'er the parrots. It's like, shut the hell up <laughs> about this. And then, of course, uh, our very own Proclaimers in their second album, mm -hmm. Cap in Hand. Um, and he, they, one of the lines in the song is, I can't understand why we let someone else rule our land. We're cap in hand. And there are others. Um, Lewis Grassett Gibbon and the Scots Hairst uh, wrote a, a, wonderful, a wonderful piece. Um, and he, he was talking about the union debate. And he said, there was little, uh, the union was brought about by a strange series of intrigues as history is aware of. England ingeniously bribed her way to power. There was little real resistance in the Scots Parliament except by such lonely figures as Fletcher of Saltoun, who we talked about. On May the 1st, 1707, Scotland officially ceased to be a country and became that part of the United Kingdom, North Britain. Scotsmen uh, officially ceased to be Scots and they became Britons, presumably North Britons. England similarly lost identity impatiently in a scrap of paper, but everyone knew, both at home and abroad, that what really had happened was the final subjugation of the Scots by the English and the absorption of the Northern people into the polity and name of uh, the Southern, and then talks about you know, the smoulder fires of resistance so um, and I think um, uh, the next time we come back to talk we'll talk about what actually happens to Scotland after the Union because it's not a good result if in fact the Union had been for economic reasons then why does Scotland see no benefit from it until the Industrial Revolution why do you have to wait 70 years before you get anything positive? That's because for the English, they weren't concerned at all about the Scottish economy. They needed to stabilize the island. They needed to make sure that the Scots couldn't make deals with the French. They needed to make sure that the French couldn't invade through Scotland. So for them, it was a political necessity. They were becoming more powerful. They needed to show that they had control of the, the, their own island before they could have control of any kind of empire. And they couldn't do it with the Scots acting independently as they had uh, you know, f since time immemorial, as mm. they had for ages and ages. So Scotland doesn't benefit um, economically. So this argument that it's an economic necessity for Scotland, which has been trotted out in 1707, in the 1970s, in the 1990s, and again in the 2013-14s, um, is, is, uh, is really absolutely hopeless because in none of those cases did that actually happen? It, it, things went badly for Scotland after the Union. And when people then say, oh, well, that's wrong, because look at Scotland and the Industrial Revolution. Look how powerful it is. It's because we had lots of men who were good inventors. It's because we had coal. It's because we had access mm -hmm. to all the things that everybody else needed to make the Industrial Revolution work. It's not because of this political thing that was, that was, in a sense, forced upon the people of Britain, but in another sense, um, it happens just because the, the elite are, are bought out. Mm -hmm. Because the, you know, the Argyll family gets to run Scotland for decades after that. So, a little passion there. There you, you go. Know, a little, little, little fired up here over uh, at the History Hut. And there's a really funny, uh, we have a satirical newspaper, it's a really funny bit in it about um, Scotland's future uncertain after the border with England was stolen. <laughs> it was really, really good. Uh, and it, it said that the only way that nobody can identify then where the border is and the only way that it would be possible is if we wait um, till the uh, World Cup and a clear debate between the two nations is expected by the reaction to England's exit from the World Cup in the group stages 
changes after a hard fought goal was draw with Costa Rica. And of course, Scots mm -hmm. they'll be able to tell who's in Scotland because we'll all be like, yay! And yeah. the English will be like, ah, oh, bummer. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, we'll end on that note. Uh, that wraps up this portion of our discussion of the Act of Union. We'll see you next time. <laughs>